Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Daniel Kabanachri for, and uh, I am going to discuss with you uh, this course, Applied Mathematics for Economics. And today, we have 13 uh, topics in all, but uh, this morning, I'm trying to discuss uh, logarithm and exponential functions, and of course, the application in economics. Right, what I intend doing is that uh, we are going to look at, you know, what a log function is and, of course, what a, an exponential function is. Look at the various algebra involved in, you know, working with them. And then I'll go on to my main focus, and that is trying to know how uh, log and expo functions are being used in economics. So if I want to be a little, you know, more specific, we are going to talk about exponential functions, algebra, you know, log functions, uh, the algebra, and then uh, the applications in economics. And here I'm focusing on three main applications. That is uh, compounding interest, uh, discounting, and how we do estimate uh, growth rates from uh, data from data points. Now, uh, applied uh, mathematics for economics is a very old uh, sort of discipline, and uh, any good, any book will help you. But then I recommend these uh, three uh, readings, which I find very, very important. Uh, the first one is Dowling, and then Alpha Chang, and uh, Raymond and uh, Ziegler. They can all be found in the library of the Department of Economics, and I think in the main library of the university. Now, what is an exponential uh, function? I will start with an exponential function. Now, an exponential function is any function of the form, you know, uh, b raised to the power, let's say, x, where we call b the base, okay? And x, it's more or less uh, the, 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 the variable. And you can see a specific example that I've given there. When you have, let's say, y equals to, you know, half x or y equals to 2 raised to the power x, these are all examples of, uh, you know, exponential, you know, functions. It pays to talk about, when you discuss any function, you talk about the domain and the range of the function. And the, if you look at all exponential functions, what we see here is that, you know, the domain of an exponential function function is the set of all what real numbers, right, with de defined over the range that we have over there. Now, if you go further, I've given you some examples of exponential functions which you can take your time and uh, go through. Uh, one thing you need to know is that for an exponential function, the base b, you know, should lie between 0 and uh, 1, right? And uh, when it's between 0 and 1, you can get half an example. When it's greater than, you know, let's say, you know, 1, you can get the example that I've given here. So it's always important to know that you can have the base being greater than 1 or lying within that range. And based upon the value of uh, the b, you are able to know how the function behaves. Uh, I would like you to have a look at how this function behaves. Uh, for the two situations that I've talked about, and the first one is when the base is uh, 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 between 0 and, and 1, and when it's more than 1. So in this example that I've given you, the graphs up there, the functions up there is what we have tried to plot. x is the variable that changes, okay? And then we have the function 2 raised to the power x, 3 raised to the power x. So what is here is that we just insert the value of x into the function. You find the corresponding value of y, and the figures is what we have over there. And uh, if we plot this function, we get something like this. What are the important features of this uh, function? One, you have to know that all the function, you know, they cut the point where x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. This is something you should never, ever forget. And when you have, you know, the, the, the base being greater than 1, you see the function increasing. Conversely, you see it decreasing. And notice that what is over there is that they never touch the zero line. They are what we call asymptotic to the zero line. So this is a function of uh, an exponential function in a situation when it's greater than, uh, the b is greater than 1, and then when the b lies within the interval 0 and 1. Uh, you've also talked about uh, the algebra, how to manipulate certain simple exponential functions. And the basic formula that we use uh, is what we have over here. And these things, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar. Those of you who did uh, elective maths, definitely you know how to work with some of these, uh, uh, these uh, tools. And uh, I wouldn't spend much time on it. There is uh, some examples that have been provided down here. 
and uh, if you see how they've worked out, you know, we've worked them out nicely using the rules in exponential functions, which I believe you can go through yourself. Now you try and hands on some of these things, all what I want you to do here is to simplify the function that we have here using the rules in exponential functions. Now, I need to also, you know, talk about what we call natural exponential functions. Notice that uh, there is this word e, which you always uh, maybe have come across. When you have, you take the limit as, uh, let's say, n approaches infinity of the function 1 plus 1 over n raised to the power uh, n, you get this value e, which is called, uh, which uh, it's a uh, 2.716 some something. Right. This value, when you have any exponential function, and instead of the base being b, the base turns out to be, you know, e, then we call it natural exponential function. Now, in many cases, we prefer, you know, calling this natural exponential functions. And if you happen to go further, you know the economic implication of this uh, e value. It has got very, very important economic implication, and you may want to know it uh, later. Now, when you grab this function for different values, this is what you get. And I think in the same way as we did earlier, you can put the values that we have over there into the function, find the y, and try to plot it, and you're going to get what we have here. Now, again, let's talk about uh, logarithmic functions. Now, the log of a given number is the number to which that base of the log must be raised in order to obtain that given number. A simple example. Notice that when you have h1 and uh, you raise 9 to the power 2, you get what? You know, 81. And we can write this as log 9, uh, log uh, h1 to the base 9 equals, you know, 2. So what it means is that what number do you have to raise 9 to in order to get what? 81. Right? What number do we have to raise 9 to in order to get 81? And that number is 2. Uh, mathematically, we try to use these symbols, log of x, y, and uh, to represent the, you know, relationship between exponential in functions and logarithmic functions. They are the, the same, but there is a relativity between them, and that relativity is what you can see over, over there. Now, again, we also have to know that, you know, when we talk about the base of a log function or the power of a, of a log function is, this, is, is the same as the base of an exponential function. So the relation that we have over here, the last line over there, do hold for log functions. If we want to plot log functions in the same way as we plotted the exponential functions, and here you can see the table that we have over here, right, where we put the value of x into the, val uh, into the values of the log functions, and there we do have the the, the graph that we have over here. One important observation here is that for a log function, at the value 0, you have here 1, right? So it turns unlike the exponential functions and is also asymptotic to the vertical axis and then it rises up or it decreases depending on the base of the log. Now, now the base of a log uh, can be any positive or uh, negative number, all right? But sometimes you want to, you know, try to differentiate between uh, a common log and an exponential log. Usually, when we talk about the base being 10, then we talk about, you know, a common logarithmic function. But in situations where we have the base being equal to an exponential, uh, uh, the value y, then we call that one a natural log. And then many books, instead of writing, let's say, log to the base e x we, we write lin x and again this is seriously applied in economics and uh, very soon you know the implications of this uh, lin x which you will meet as we go on another thing we may have to discuss it's about the rules in logarithm those of you again who did e mass may have come across uh, these ones right the addition uh, uh, the, the the product rule the quotient rule the power rule, the base research rule, and other miscellaneous rules in log functions uh, is what you have on the whiteboard. And uh, I'm asking you to look at these examples. I've tried to solve these ones 
all what we're doing is that we're using these properties uh, of log functions to resolve the, the equations that I've given, and you can go through yourself. But further, I would like you to, you know, do some exercises on your own. Now, now that we do have a good understanding of exponential and log functions, the next thing we have to discuss is that what is the use of all this mathematics? We are economists, why do we worry ourselves with mathematics? The simple rule is that there are three major things that we use, you know, logarithm and exponential functions, you know, to solve in economics. The first one is interest compounding. Recall that when you go to any bank and you borrow money from the bank, definitely you have to pay interest, isn't it? And the interest that you pay more or less may depend on the interest rate which you agree with the bank. Am I right? So in this simple example that I have here, assuming that you have, you borrow a certain amount, I call it P, from the bank, okay? And the banks are saying their interest rate is, let's say, R. Uh, you know, today I don't know the interest rate, but sometimes if you go to the bank, it can be, you know, 21, 31%, whatever. Now, what happens is that at the end of the year, what you have to do is that you have to give the bank the money that you collected P, and then you have to add a percentage of the money that depends on R, that is what, PR. So at the end of the first year, you are going to pay A1, which is equal to P plus uh, P multiplied by R, as you see over there. Now, what happens is that assuming you don't pay that money back, back to the bank, and then you want to still borrow that you know, money for the second year, at the end of the second year, what happens is that you have with the bank, so the bank would have given you P plus R, sorry, P plus PR, okay, that's the principal now, and then you are also going to pay them an amount P plus, you know, PR all multiplied by an R. And that is what you see in the first equation. That is, at the end of the second year, this is what you're going to pay. And notice that if you do simple algebra, uh, algebra you are going to get P into bracket 1 plus R raised to the power square. You can go on, take P equals 3, pick, take P equals 4, and then you see that if P is equal to T, that is, at any time T, you are going to get, I mean, you are going to pay the amount uh, P multiplied by 1 plus R raised to the power T, at the end of t years. Now, I did say earlier, or I didn't introduce you to discrete and uh, continuous compoundings. When you go to the bank and you want money from the bank, you have to know whether the interest rate is being calculated on discrete basis or on continued basis. When you talk about discrete base, what it means is that you know uh, you are the, the the interest is being compounded at the end of a fixed term let's say a year, so at the end of the year, it's being compounded, and every year at the end of the year is being compounded. There are also situations where the interest is being compounded continuously, that is at any time t, okay? What we have discussed uh, is a situation when the interest is compounded at the end of the year, and that is why you have a, at the, time, at the end of time t, you have the amount that you have to pay the bank being equal to P multiplied by 1 plus R raised to the power T. So here, what I'm saying is that the interest is being compounded at the end of the year. But again, notice that uh, there are situations in which interest will not be compounded, you know, only at the end of the year. It's possible to go for a situation where interest is being compounded, let's say, quarterly, or is being compounded every six months. In that way, this formula changes, right? In that way, what is happening is that at the end of the year, you are going to, depending upon how the interest is compounded, you are going to pay an amount, which is equal to uh, P multiplied by one plus, you know, R raised to the, R divided by MT, all raised to the power RT. And I'm going to explain this, and I'm going to, explain this. In this last formula that you see over here, M is the number of times that interest is being compounded. Okay? M is the number of times that interest is being compounded in the year, in course of the year. So if interest is being compounded, let's say uh, quarterly, then it means M is going to be, is equal to what? Four. If interest is being compounded, you know, every six months, then M is going to be what? Two. 
And if that is the case, then this is the situation or this is the, uh, the total amount that you may have to, you know, pay the, the bank at the, if the interest is compounded, you know, based on a certain number of times in a year. So notice that when you do have interest or you go and borrow money from the bank, you should know whether the interest is compounded quarterly monthly right in situation where m uh, interest is being compounded monthly for example it means m is equal to 12 right and how much you're going to pay to the bank would depend on how you know the compoundings are made in a situation where you are dealing with discrete compounding and it's very important to take all these things into consideration before borrowing from the bank further i try to you know solve some examples. In the first example, I've given you your P, your R, and then your T. What you have to do here is that you should be very good in changing your formula. In the formula that I have over there, sorry, when we go to this formula that I have over here, you have so many variables. You have P, you have A, you have M, you have T. And notice that in this formula, whenever I give you, you have how many variables? A, P, R, and then T, you have five of them, right? A being one, P being two, R being three, M being four, and then T being five. So you have sort of uh, five variables. Whenever I give you any four, you should be able to solve the last one. So if I give you a P, I give you R, I give you M, I give you T, and then I give you, yeah, that is four, you should be able to find A. And how you find A will depend upon how you good you are in terms of, uh, you know, working with change of uh, subject. So the question can be formulated in any direction.